This morning, our text is Mark's Gospel. We're continuing in chapter 13. Again, uh, feel free to turn there in your Bibles if you want to, or you can read it on the screen uh, behind me. Mark chapter 13. By the way, if I haven't identified this text already, I should probably do so now as what we call the Olivet Discourse. For some reason, we seem to um, only call it that when it's in Matthew's Gospel. <laughs> and uh, don't call it that in the other Gospels, but that is, as a matter of fact, what this is. And that's important because of what we're going to be looking at this evening as we continue to uh, move, as it were, out of the way those particular passages in Scripture uh, that seem to indicate that there are really horrible times ahead for the church. I mean, how can we be optimistic about the future if it looks like there's nothing but, but difficulty in the future for us? Well, what we're going to see and what we have been seeing in this passage is that Jesus is not talking about the future here. He's actually talking about the past. Let's uh, read for verses 14 through 23, which is our text this morning. Jesus says this, But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it should not be, let the reader understand. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. The one who is on the housetop must not go down or go in to get anything out of his house. And the one who is in the field must not turn back to get his coat. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. But pray that it may not happen in the winter. For those days will be a time of tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the creation which God created until now and never will. Unless the Lord had shortened those days, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. And then if anyone says to you, behold, here is the Christ, or behold, he is there, do not believe him. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show signs and wonders in order to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But take heed, behold, I have told you everything in advance. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now again, we've seen so far in this chapter that Jesus was speaking about something that was about to come upon Israel in those days not about something that was going to come upon them in the future. Uh, he was answering his disciples' question regarding the temple, when it was going to be destroyed. I mean, Jesus had said, you see all these wonderful buildings, not one stone would be left upon another which would not be cast down. He told them what it is they should be looking for that would lead up to this event. He told them what it is they should do when it comes. And he told them how it is they should be ready for it. And most importantly, I want you to remember again, in verse 30, he says something that's very important. He told them that that generation in which they were living would not pass away until all the things that he was speaking about had come to pass. Jesus was not saying that that race of people would not cease to be a race of people. But he was saying the people who were alive at that time would see these things come to pass. Now Jesus began by showing them or telling them the signs that this event was about to take place. He said there would be false Christs, there would be wars, famines, earthquakes, persecutions, and that the gospel would be preached in the whole world by which he meant of course the Roman Empire. And we know historically these things were actually fulfilled. But he also gave them the promise, as we saw last time, that even though that things would be getting tough for them, that if they endured to the end by his grace, they would be saved. Yes, Jesus said difficult times were coming, but he wasn't going to leave them on their own. The Lord was going to help them. He was going to give them the strength to persevere, and if they did, he would keep them safe. 
Now we're going to see something more about that um, this morning as we consider the next thing that Jesus moves on to tell them, which is the signs that this event had arrived. And that sign basically has to do with the abomination of desolation. This morning I want us to consider three things. First of all, what is the abomination of desolation that Jesus is speaking of? Secondly, why it is that Jesus warned them to run when they saw it? And thirdly, the promise that Jesus gave them to give them hope in the middle of that circumstance. So first of all, what is or what was the abomination of desolation? Because Jesus does say in verses 14 through 18, the abomination of desolation would be the signal, the signal that they were to run. When they saw it, they were to get away immediately. Those in Judea were to flee to the mountains. They had to leave so quickly, Jesus said, that if a man were on top of his house, and by the way, it doesn't mean he was up there fixing the roof necessarily. As you know, they basically used their roof as an additional room in those days. If you happen to be on the roof, Jesus says, don't even take the time to go into your house to get anything you need. If you happen to be in the fields, don't even turn back to get your cloak, but run. He said, such a quick exit would be difficult for those in those days who were expecting or nursing. Jesus goes on to say, pray. Pray for the Lord's mercy that this event does not take place in the winter because in order to flee in the winter, it would be quite difficult. So when they see the abomination, they are simply the abomination of desolation. They are to get away as quickly as possible. Now the question is, what? is or what was the abomination of desolation. I don't know how many of you have plugged into uh, modern churches. This is something that's kind of been beat to death, at least it was in the churches that I was in. You know that the prevalent view in most evangelical churches is that of dispensationalism, and dispensationalists see the fulfillment of this in the future. The time after the church is raptured when the Antichrist appears and he makes a covenant with Israel for seven years that allows them to rebuild their temple. In the middle of those seven years, they believe that the Antichrist is going to set up an image of himself in the temple. And that is going to be the abomination of desolation. And that will also usher in what is called the Great Tribulation, or that which Jesus is speaking about, they believe, in verse 19 of our text. For those type days will be a time of tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the creation which God created until now and never will. Now the question is, is that what Jesus was talking to his disciples about back in around 30 AD? Was he talking about an event that is still future from our perspective or was he warning the disciples of something that they would live to see? Well, whatever this abomination of desolation is, Jesus actually tells us where we can find it. He tells us in Matthew 24, in verses 15 and 16, in a passage that is parallel to the one we're looking at right now. He says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Whatever this abomination of desolation is, I think everyone agrees, we will find it in the book of Daniel. Now, one of the problems in going to the book of Daniel is that Daniel speaks about more than one abomination of desolation. At least he does from our perspective. One of them is found in two verses, Daniel 11.31, and Daniel 12, 11. I'm not going to really read those texts because I just want to say I don't have time to prove it. But what Daniel is speaking about there is a desecration of the temple that takes place during that period of time, that 400 years between the closing of the Old Testament and the opening of the New. That time uh, that Antiochus Epiphanes, you've probably heard the name before, uh, actually slaughters a pig and spills his blood on the altar in the temple. Now, dispensationalists believe that those two texts are also referring to the future, the Antichrist, and everything that I just talked about. But we believe that those texts are actually referring to an event that took place several 
thousand years ago, actually a couple thousand years ago during what we call the intertestamental period. But there is another passage in Daniel that refers to the desolation of the temple and even calls it something of an abomination and, and not surprisingly, it's found in that text we were looking at last Sunday evening. Daniel chapter 9, verses 26 and 27. Let me read that for you. This is what, uh, again, Gabriel telling Daniel, as far as Daniel seeking what the Lord's will is for Israel, Gabriel says this to him regarding the Messiah. First of all, he told him that when the Messiah would come, it would be basically uh, 69 weeks. Jerusalem would be rebuilt and so forth, and the Messiah is going to come after that. Then he says that after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince, and again, the prince here is the Messiah who is to come, will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. And he, that is Messiah, will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. Not the Antichrist, but the Christ but in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction. One that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. Now, I want you to, to see, if you can, from this particular text, that this abomination that he is referring to that makes desolate has to do with the destruction of the holy city, Jerusalem, and the sanctuary or the temple in a way that we've already seen last week. It was accomplished historically by the Romans in 70 AD, the people of the prince who was coming. Now, I don't have time to explain all of that because that's what we looked at last Lord's Day. But I do believe it's this event that Jesus is talking about in our text. Now, here's another good reason to understand it this way. You know how in the Synoptic Gospels or the first three Gospels that many of the events that Jesus talks about are actually repeated in each of the three Gospels. And so we have parallel accounts of each of these things. Well, it's interesting that in Luke chapter 21, which is the Olivet Discourse in Luke, we have a parallel passage where Jesus replaces the phrase abomination of desolation with something else that fits perfectly with what we're looking at. This is what we read in Luke 21, verses 20 through 22. But when you see, not the abomination of desolation, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that her desolation is near. Now, what should you do when you see this? He goes on. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains, and those who are in the midst of the city must leave, and those who are in the county must not enter the city, because these are days of vengeance, so that all things which are written will be fulfilled. So what is the abomination of desolation that Jesus is warning them about? It is when the Roman armies invade the Holy Land, surround the holy city and destroy that city and the sanctuary. Jesus is warning his disciples that when they see the armies of Rome surrounding Jerusalem, that they are to get out of that city and out of that country because these are the days of God's vengeance. Well, God's vengeance against whom? Against the Jews for killing his son. Remember that in Matthew's Gospel, we have a whole chapter leading up to the Olivet Discourse where Jesus is talking about God's judgment upon Israel. And all of Matthew 23 is a series of indictments against the Jewish people for their mistreatment of God's prophets and ultimately his son. Let me read Jesus' conclusion in Matthew 23. And again, you'll see what I'm talking about. Beginning in verse 34, he says, Therefore, behold, I am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Some of them you will scourge in your synagogues. 
and persecute from city to city so that upon you may fall the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah the son of Berechiah whom you murdered between the temple and the altar truly I say to you all these things will come upon this generation Jerusalem Jerusalem who kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to her how often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were unwilling now listen to these final words behold your house is being left to you desolate so what is the abomination of desolation something that was going to happen over 2,000 years in the future from the time Jesus was speaking no Jesus was not warning them of an event that is still future even to us but he was warning his disciples of what was going to happen to them to Jerusalem then to the Jews then in 70 AD which was 40 years away history tells us that the Roman armies did in fact march against Jerusalem and those who remembered Jesus' warning were ready and they fled the country. They fled to the mountains and they were safe. Now that's what the abomination of desolation is. That was the signal that they were to look for, that they were to get out of the country. Now secondly, why was Jesus warning them to flee? Well, I think we've already seen something of that. He says in verse 19, for those days will be a time of tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the creation which God created until now and never will. Whatever it is Jesus was warning of here, Jesus is saying it was going to be the worst thing that has ever happened to any people in history and that would ever happen to any people in the future, I think, of course, accepting the final judgment. It would be worse than what God did to the world, as it were, in, in the flood of Noah. Not with regard to the number of people who died, but at least with regard to the difficulties they had to go through. Worse than what God did to Sodom and Gomorrah. Worse than what he did to Egypt. Worse than what he did to the Jews when he took them out of the land into captivity for 70 years. Because God was judging them for a crime that was much worse than any crime any people has ever committed and that was the rejection and murder of his son the desolation of their house would be more horrible than anything that had ever happened or would happen again now what actually happened in 70 AD you know we don't have time of course to go through much detail but let me just give you a few of the highlights or lowlights we might call in this case and refer you to the study that we did on uh, the Olivet Discourse and the Book of Revelation where we looked in some detail, especially in the Book of Revelation, because I do believe it's referring to the same event, God's judgment upon the Jews in 70 AD, and correlated the things that Josephus, who was an eyewitness, actually recorded with what Jesus was telling John would actually take place and what he was telling his disciples here would actually take place. This is how Josephus describes it in his introduction to his book called Wars of the Jews. He says, the war which the Jews made with the Romans has been the greatest of all those, not only that have been in our times, but in a manner of those that ever were heard of, both wherein cities have fought against cities or nations against nations. Now what happened in this war? Well, as you know, the Romans came against Jerusalem at the time of the Passover. They surrounded and besieged the city for five months when there were many, many more people inside the city at that time than there would otherwise have been. And that this siege actually came toward the end of a war that had lasted for three and a half years with, uh, with Rome, in which case there, there were many, many people who had died. Some said um, the blood flowed uh, liberally. The land was virtually painted with blood and it had splattered even up to as high as a horse's bridle. Not only was there war outside the city with the Romans, but as we saw when we went through the book of Revelation, there was also fighting that was taking place within the city because Jerusalem, while besieged, was divided in what was called a civil war. 
there were three factions in the city fighting against one another for possession of goods as well as power. Many people in the city died at the hands of their own countrymen. Many people died from plagues in the city, from famine. People were killing their neighbors for a morsel of food, and some were even so hungry that they were willing to eat their own children. Now, Jesus was saying, again, this is the worst thing that had ever happened or ever would again. Things within the city were horrible. Also at this time, people were being led astray by false Christ, as we saw earlier in the signs leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem. The same would be true at this event. There were those who rose up claiming to be the Messiah. Just follow me, and I will deliver you from the Romans. Josephus said at this time there were not only false Christs, but there were also false prophets. Let me read to you one account. Now, were there were then, or excuse me, thou, there was then a great number of false prophets suborned by the tyrants to impose on the people, the tyrants being the leaders of the three factions, who denounced this to them that they should wait for deliverance from God. And this was in order to keep them from deserting and that they might be buoyed up above fear and care by such hopes. Now, a man that is in adversity does easily comply with such promises, for when such a seducer makes him believe that he shall be delivered from those miseries which oppress him, then it is that the patient is full of hopes of such deliverance. There was one occasion where Josephus says a false prophet made a public proclamation in the city on the very day that the Romans broke in, to, uh, they finally broke in the city and uh, slaughtered a number of people, that God had commanded them to get uh, upon the pinnacle of the temple where they would receive miraculous signs of their deliverance. There were something like 6,000 people who followed the prophet, and they all died, as well as many others when the Romans finally broke in. Of course, many people had died before even that had happened. Josephus records that in this war between the Jews and the Romans, that 1,100,000 Jews died. Again, Jesus warns, for those days will be a time of tribulation, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the creation, which God created until now, and never will. Jesus was warning them, when you see this abomination of desolation, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by these armies, get out of the country. Jesus was warning them because of what was coming. But Jesus was also warning them because they were the ones who were going to live to see it. He wasn't warning of a future event. It was future from their perspective. They were living in 30 AD. This was coming in 70 AD. But he was not warning of an event that is future to us. He was warning them. He says, you take heed. Behold, I have told you everything in advance. And again, the reason why Jesus did that is because he loves his people. And he wanted to spare them this judgment that was meant for those who were actually going to take his life, who would reject him. By the way, we need to understand, before the Lord brought this judgment, he did everything he possibly could have to gather his people together. You've got to remember, there's 40 years between the crucifixion and 70 AD. And what was happening during those 40 years? God had sent his apostles out to proclaim the gospel to the Jew first and then to the Gentile to make sure that every Jew had the opportunity to hear the gospel and to receive the promises that God had given to them before he brought this judgment. And after he had gathered together all of his sheep, all of his elect out of Israel, then he brought this judgment upon them. Now, finally, let's look at the last point. What was the promise of hope that Jesus gave to them? I want you to notice verse 20. Unless the Lord had shortened those days, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. The Lord here promises in advance that he was going to limit the time of this judgment in his mercy. He said if he had not done this, all the Jews would have died. Now, I want you to notice that Jesus is not saying that he, he was going to do this for the Jews in general. 
because this was his judgment against the Jews. The Lord gave this promise with an eye toward his elect, his chosen ones, his elect that basically were scattered throughout that country, those who remembered his warning and who listened to it and fled to the mountains. Jesus was going to shorten those days so that they might survive. To those elect that were trapped in the city, sadly, there were Christians that were trapped in Jerusalem that had to go through what that city went through. When it was surrounded, he shortened the days so that some of them might survive to serve him further. Undoubtedly, some of these died in Jerusalem under the siege. And yet, the Lord shortened their days, the days of their sufferings, by taking them to glory. By the way, when a Christian dies, that's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. The Apostle Paul actually said he would prefer to die and go to be with the Lord. But if the Lord willed that he stayed here, he would continue to serve him and work for him. It's not a bad thing to die. It's actually a blessing if you are a believer. He shortened the days for the, his elect that were yet to come to faith in the city and in the country, and even those that were yet to be born of them. He shortened the days that they might live and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Perhaps um, for those who were living at the time and seeing the fulfillment of Christ's prophecy, that this would be what would be the thing that would bring them to faith. Jesus warned. They saw everything he warned of came to pass. Sometimes God uses that to bring people to faith. But the Lord shortened the days for the sake of his elect because he loves his people. I mean, Jesus is not, you know... Uh, ignorant, as it were, or unconcerned about what happens to his people, you need to realize when the Lord brings national judgment, it does affect his people. But it's also true that because of his love for his people, that God always has a special concern for them. He takes care of them in some way. He'll certainly never let them go, as we've already seen. And if they should die, he will take them to be with him in glory. But very often, he spares them them, as we see throughout the Old Testament when God brings judgment on his own people, or as we see even in this case, the Lord cares about his people, he loves them, so he takes care that they're not destroyed in judgment. Now let's end on this particular point, which I think is very encouraging, because what Jesus did for his people in those days, he continues to do for his people today. If you are one of the Lord's elect, if you are one of his chosen ones, which again, you can know you are, not by going into heaven and seeing if your name is written in a book, but rather by looking within yourself to see whether or not you see these marks, you can know that you are. And those marks you know, I think, pretty well by now. If you love the Lord, if you're trusting Jesus Christ as your Savior and him alone, with your whole heart to save you and not your own works, if you're repenting of your sins and you are obeying him, following after him, then you can know that you are one of God's elect people. And that's really the only way you can know. Basically, it all boils down to love. Because if you really love the Lord, then you will do these things. You cannot help but do these things. If these things are true of you, then you need to realize that God has his eye on you for your good because he loves you. Everything that the Lord actually does in this world, everything he does in your life in a certain sense is for you. I mean, God is preserving the world for your sake because you are in this world. Why doesn't God just destroy the world right now? Why doesn't he just bring judgment? Why does he even continue on with the sinful race of people that exist in this world? It's because of his church. It's for the sake of his elect. He does this because he's gathering his people together. He's doing this because his people exist in this world. That's why he preserves the world. The Bible tells us that our Lord Jesus Christ is reigning in heaven right now, and he is absolutely sovereign over everything that is happening in the world. 
He's actually watching over everything that happens in your life, even your sins, to make sure that whatever happens is working together for your good and not for your harm because the Lord loves you and because He cares about you. And why is it that the Lord loves you? Well, it's not because we deserve it. We already saw that God didn't choose you. He didn't choose me because we deserved it, because we were so lovable, because he couldn't live without us. But it's because that is what the Lord has chosen to do, purely out of his sovereign love for you and for his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a reason why the Lord is doing this for you and for me. It's a reason why he loves you and has chosen you. Now, again, it's not because of anything in us, but it's because of his son. The Lord has chosen you. He saved you. He preserves you. He works everything together for your good. He, he's going to make sure you're not going to fall away and that you're eventually going to make it to heaven. And the reason is because he has made his son a promise. And that is for everyone that Jesus has laid his life down for, he is going to give those people to Jesus to be his people, to be his reward, to be his bride for the rest of eternity. He is preserving you to give you to Jesus Christ. And you can take comfort in this the next time you're going through a trial, or I should say with the trial you're going through right now, because I'm not sure if there ever is a time when we're not. It just seems like they're either you know, more severe or less severe. But think about that. That trial is not going to destroy you. It's not going to overwhelm you. You're not going to fall away from the Lord because the Lord is preserving you so that he may give you to his son. He has promised to give you to his son, and he's not going to go back on that promise. That is a tremendous comfort. Nothing in heaven or earth can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now, again, that is a comfort to you if... You are one of the Lord's people, but it doesn't apply to you if you are not one of his people. And again, how can you know? This is the big question that usually arises when you think about election. Well, how can I know whether I'm one of God's elect? How can I know if I'm chosen? Well, again, you can't know in any other way by simply doing this. You can only settle the question by trusting in Jesus Christ. If you trust in Jesus, if you turn from your sins, if you follow him, then you are God's elect. Because the only way you can do that is by his grace. If you do this, then you can know that he loves you. And you can also know that everything that the Lord does in this world, everything he does in your life, even the things you don't like about your life, he is doing all these things for your good, not for your bad, not to hurt you, not to harm you, not to make life difficult for you, but for your good. He will ultimately work it together for good. If you haven't trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you haven't believed on him alone for salvation, believe on him now, and he will save you. May the Lord grant that you would do that that you might be able to apprehend this wonderful promise that Jesus gave to his people in the midst of this difficult time of judgment, you can have that same promise. You can have that same blessing if you trust the Lord this morning and that he will ultimately bring you through the final judgment and into heaven, into the new heavens and the new earth. May the Lord grant that every single one of us may trust the Lord turn from our sins, and know this blessing. Let's, uh, let's bow in a moment of prayer, and let's ask the Lord to apply his word to our souls as we need to hear it this morning.